Okay, this is a video to go over the phase test uh, preparation exercise, um, which basically consists of a phase test from 2015. Um, so I'll just go through and uh, give you the answers and explain, hopefully reasonably in brief, why the answers are correct. Um, so, looking at question one, it says connect up the objects and move them if necessary so that pressing the button object, which is this one, prints one, two, three, four in the max window uh, in the following order. So, basically, one, two, three, and four should appear in that order. Um, and this is worth 10%, um, but it should be a fairly easy one to, uh, to succeed in um, just by fiddling around with the objects a bit. So. Uh, what we'll do is um, connect the button up to all of the uh, message boxes with the numbers in and in turn connect those to the print object. So this is the way to connect things if you want uh, the message boxes to, to be sent into the print object. Um, and as they are at the moment, if I click on, uh, oh, we'll need the uh, max window up of course, so command M brings that up. Um, and if I click on the button object, uh, then we have the numbers in this order, which is the incorrect one. But you'll notice that in fact uh, it's two, one, four, and three. So they're moving leftwards um, uh, in terms of the order in which they appear in this uh, console display. Um, so uh, if I were to do it, which I suppose would be the more intuitive way of, or most intuitive way of laying them out, you'd want them in order from left to right because that's the way we read but if you lock the patch try again we get 4321 so obviously that's wrong so we'll try it the other way around Oops. like that try again And we get one, two, three, four. So uh, the key lesson here is that messages are sent from right to left. So f down the f the rightmost uh, cable first, and then uh, proceeding leftwards um, from the button object. And if you want to know more about this right to left movement, you'll need to have a look at the uh, basic but critical issues tutorials that I've done elsewhere. Okay, uh, probably took longer than I meant to on that one. So question two, uh, it simply asks you to change the colour of the uh, keyboard that you've got here and the range. Um, <clears throat> and you need to do that by means of the inspector window. So if I click on the object, whoops, I'm not the patch. Click on the object, click on I, um, and uh, you will see in here the black key colour. Um, so we can change that simply by clicking on the colour and then choosing a different one. And then uh, changing the range, we need to, the range is basically the number of notes that are shown. So there, of course, we need to look at the number of notes. Uh, what does it say? It sets the number of keys in the keyboard display. Um, so at the moment there are 48 keys showing. We only want one octave. Well, an octave would be, uh, well, we think of an octave as being 12 notes. Um, so if I put in 12 notes, then we get this. But of course that doesn't accommodate the full octave because we don't go from C to C. So I'm going to put in 13. I would accept 12 or 13 in that case though. But we've got um, the full octave there. So that's number two, 5%, easy money. Uh, very easy, that one. Third one is also very easy. It says, make a live step object in the space below. Now, when you see uh, an object name or a, a word that is um, encased in these square brackets, uh, that refers to an object name. Um, I've kind of adopted the convention of using these square brackets. I'm not sure that Max itself does, but I find that it's uh, clearer to put it like this. Um, where you see uh, the object put in um, sort of represented like that, then it means that you can simply write it into an object box 
and when you click out of that box it makes the object that you want. Um, I find this uh, somewhat easier than trawling through the object menu up here which is a little bit cumbersome I find. Um, so it, you would find it if you went to the uh, there you go, Max for Live Objects, click on that one, and then one of these ones will be the Live Step object. I'm not sure which one it is, actually. Anyway, it's one of these. Um, you'd find it there, but because I know the name of the object, it's simply easier for me to write it into a box. How do I know the name of the object? Well, you'd see it if I uh, looked in the, the help file. So there it is, live.step. Um, so I, I, I find out the name of the object from that. Um, open the help file for that object and navigate, navigate to counter driven sequencer tab. So I could open the help window by right clicking and choosing it from the contextual menu but I'm just pressing alt and clicking on the object and uh, here it is. Um, and it says look for counter driven sequencing the tab along the top. Uh, so there's that and I simply ask you to copy this uh, patch uh, into your main um, uh, patch. So if I select the bits that I want to copy, simply copy that, close that and paste and there it is. So I'll just move it into the main part of the window and then it says you can delete the original live step object. Why have we asked you to do this? Because when you're working with Max uh, you'll find that quite a lot of your activity involves copying and pasting and some of that copying and pasting might involve copying and pasting other people's patches or third-party uh, patches. That's fine. Um, the only proviso to that is that uh, you always need to declare where that copied data comes from. Um, otherwise it's plagiarism. Uh, but as long as you do that then it's perfectly acceptable in many cases at least, to borrow code from other people. That's kind of part of the, the whole kind of Max and programming um, culture to do that. Um, so anyway, that's uh, question three. Now, if you manage to get all three of those questions, which weren't that tricky, then you would have 20% uh, before you've really done anything else. Um, so we move on to this one. Now, this one's a little bit trickier unless you've kind of explored... Um, some of the basic but critical issues, but um, it says use the plus object to add two floating point numbers. So the plus object, this one, uh, is one of many um, mathematical operators or mathematical operator objects that uh, you can use for um, calculations. Um, and they all work in much the same way, so you'll have two uh, inlets on the top which represent your left and your right operands um, so those being the numbers that you'd have on either side of the symbol itself. So you'd always add one number to another number and one of those numbers would be on the left hand side of the plus and one of them would be on the right. Those are your operands and those are represented by the two inlets that are here. Um, and then your uh, whatever the result is will be spat out at the bottom of course. Um, so uh, if you want to add those numbers then you simply connect these up. So two numbers, your left and your right operands, and then uh, your output. Um, <clears throat> so what, does it, what else does it say? Input numbers using the flow number ob objects, so these are float number objects, uh, hence the dot in them, which will is significant and we'll come back to. And then it says use the button object to allow the plus object to output values when either of the input values are changed. Um, well, we'll have a look at that in a minute. Um, and then, yeah, I'll come to come to this tip uh, shortly. So let's lock the patch and try one of these uh, uh, numbers. OK, well, I'll try the left one first. So I'll put input a number into that and we get to 34. Um, 34 plus, well, this is 0. OK, so the left hand of the, the plus object is now 34. The right hand is 0 because we haven't sent anything to that yet. So 34 plus 0 is 34. That's fine. Um, if I change the right hand side then oh dear nothing happens. Um, so 34 plus 22 is not 34. Why did nothing coming out? Well because, uh, and maybe I need to zoom in for this, and this again is something you will cover in the basic but critical issues, um, we're dealing with a cold inlet. So while the number 22 was sent to the plus object, 
um, and populated its right hand side, so populated the right uh, operand bit of that object, um, uh, it won't produce output. So remember, cold inlets do not produce output. They'll store the data, but they won't produce output. So to get output, I need to change the something in the left hand inlet, which is the red one and represents a hot inlet, and hot inlets always produce output. So if I change this value here, then suddenly the, the result pops to uh, 57. Um, so 35 plus 22 is 57. That's fine. Um, and we'll find the same behavior whatever we do with this. So if I, uh, whenever I change this right hand uh, number box, then nothing happens. Whenever I change the left one, we get the correct calculation. So what we'd really want to do is to um, get the a plus object to produce an output, even if we're not send, you know, even even when we send something to the right hand side. How do we do that? Well, basically, what we want to do is to, oops, is we want to trigger um, this hot inlet. But of course, uh, we don't want to trigger that by sending something new to the left hand side, because otherwise we'd change the number. Um, so what we do is we simply send a bang to it. Um, and that means that whenever I change this number, if I press the uh, button object, then it tells the plus object to spit out whatever it last received as the left operand along with whatever it last received for the right one. And so we get 40 plus 60 is 100. That's correct. Um, of course, even that is slightly cumbersome because we have to perform two operations in order to get one output or one result. So if I change this, I then still have to click on the button object in order to get that output. So wouldn't it be nice if we could simply get output whenever we change this number box? Um, and the way to do that is simply to connect that up to there. So the, the value is still coming out of the, uh, uh, the number box. It's going into the plus object and it's going into uh, the button object. The button object converts it to a bang, so to a trigger message. So we're not, it's not like we're sending 81 to the left hand side of the object, which of course would um, not be helpful. Uh, we're simply using it to uh, make the button do what it does, which is to output bangs um, every time it receives something um, and we get the right number out as you will see so every time I change this one now we're we're getting output so either of these number boxes will now yield some output um, just one more thing to say about the button object if you remember from again the basic but critical issues um, the button object has to be in a particular place so notice that it uh, is to the left of the lead that is uh, connecting that number box to the plus object. Um, if I were to move it to the right hand side of that, um, then we are going to get some slightly anomalous uh, behavior. So if I change this now to uh, 130, well, let's, let's make sure that we get um, more uh, easy to see values. So, oops, there we go. So 100 plus 12 is not 111. 100 plus 2 is not 103. 100 plus 18 is not 117. So we're getting the incorrect value at the moment. And that's because <clears throat> what's happening is that uh, we're encountering the right to left issue again. First of all, the 18 is coming out of along this lead into the button object and triggering output from this hot uh, inlet to the plus object before the new number is being sent to uh, the right hand side of uh, the plus object. So if I were to update this to a 19, then uh, the last number that was in here was 18. Um, so that is the number that is being triggered by this um, this bang that's been coming that's that's triggered in turn by the button object. Um, so we get 100 plus 18, which is 118. That happens. That all happens before we get the 19 going into the right hand side of the the plus object. Um, so uh, this right to left issue is important here because it determines the order of events, the the order in which um, things happen. Uh, 
within a seemingly instantaneous process. Um, so what I'll do is to move that back and the behavior is now going to be correct. So 100 plus 38 is now 138. So the last part of this question is this tip. You will need to do something very specific to the plus object to allow it to output float. So even if at the moment, if even if I change the uh, the number box um, so that it, uh, or either of them, so that they uh, work with floating point numbers, then our output remains a full integer. So there's no decimal pointage after that, in spite of the fact that 95.3 plus 39.49 will not be 134. It's being truncated um, to, the, the, the output is being truncated to 134. So we need to find a way of getting the plus object to deal with floats, and we do that simply by telling it what kind of number it should receive. Um, so putting in a zero point in there just tells it that uh, it needs to work with uh, decimals. And now that will work. So you see the decimals coming out of the bottom. So these floating point number boxes will always work uh, will always accommodate floats, but the plus object will not accommodate a float unless it ha unless you actually write it in as an argument, so zero point to tell it to do that. So uh, again, it, it kind of required the slightly laborious explanation um, uh, just to make sure that you uh, get that right. That's, that is a question or something very similar that will crop up in your face test. Next question. This one. Here again we've got some plus objects uh, and it says uh, connect the objects below such that pressing keys on the case slider triggers open chords containing the original note, the notes seven semitones above the original notes and put a plural there, shouldn't be, a note one octave to 12 semitones above the original note. So what do we have? We have a means of getting notes uh, out um, and a way of making notes. Um, and we have a case slider which will uh, give us a note number. So to get our original note, which is what we um, are required to produce, we need only connect the left-hand outlet of the key case slider, which gives us our note number, to the left-hand inlet of make note. Uh, that will work fine to produce that, and we can test it. works um, and then it says the rest of it is basically given for you so we have to calculate um, a note that will be seven to seven times above the original uh, that was output by K slider um, so we can simply put in plus seven because we're dealing in note numbers that will give us two semitones above and we get uh, a perfect fifth above our original note, so that's seven semitones. And then just to add the octave above, we just need to put in plus 12. And that gives us our open chord. An open chord basically is one without a third in it, so it'll be uh, one, uh, the, the, the uh, tonic, the perfect fifth above, and then the octave above. And you can play parallel, parallel uh, open chords like that. Um, so the next one, this one's a little trickier because I've, I've essentially given you a programming brief and this is how you would encounter most programming briefs. You know, you, you'd, you'd be asked to produce a tool which might be, I don't know, if you were working in, in, uh, in finance or something, you might be asked to produce a database that does X and Y. Um, they won't tell you what, what objects to use for that, they'll just say, um, uh, what what the end product will need to be. So that's what we've got up here. So what is that end product? Um, well, it's not a database. It is to connect these objects so that the cycle object, which is down here, uh, generates random pictures between C2, which is the note number 48, and C3, which is the note number 60. Uh, and that's to happen every 200 milliseconds. Uh, you won't have to change any of the given arguments. So all of the objects that you need are down here, um, along with all of the arguments that are uh, populating those objects. Um, 
So if you look at a, a question like this and panic a little bit, then uh, do the bits you can you know um, you can do first of all. Uh, so the bits that you know you can do are very likely to be okay. Well, um, you have if you've worked at all with MSP already, then you'll know that this is probably the last thing in your chain because it's the thing that's going to um, uh, produce the output or send the output to the uh, sound card. So we'll put that right at the bottom, and it, in all likelihood, your volume control will be the penultimate thing in the chain uh, because that's the thing that's going to control the overall volume. So we will um, connect those up. Notice that, by the way, that although this is a mono object, it's only taking one channel. Um, I'm sending the output to two channels, meaning the left and the right uh, outputs. So that would be the end of the chain. Um, and at the top of the chain, uh, we're being we're being asked here to uh, do something every 200 milliseconds. So we need something that is going to produce a trigger every 200 milliseconds uh, in order to get the rest of the stuff to happen. Um, and so the likelihood is that at the top of our chain, we're going to want a metro object with a means of turning it on. So we've got the beginning and the end of our chain. So what about the rest of the things we're being asked to do? It says, uh, generate random pitches between C2 and C3. Now, where you see random and between, then you're being asked to produce um, a set of random numbers uh, within a range. Uh, so, uh, and where it says between X and Y, um, but, that, uh, but X isn't zero, then you're being required to generate an offset. So the two things that you're always going to need if you want uh, to produce a random number and an offset are random and plus. So what are we, we being asked for? We're being asked for the note number 48 to the note number 60. Well, how many numbers are within that range? Uh, well, uh, there are 13 numbers in that range. Um, so uh, I said all the arguments were given for you. Um, there you have a random object with... Uh, a value of 13, or an argument of 13. That means that you'll get numbers from 0 to 12. Uh, remember, rem random always produces numbers between uh, from 0 uh, to 1 less than the number you put in as an argument. Um, so that's that. Uh, that will give you your range that you're requiring. Um, and then you take the lowest number and you use that as an offset. So our lowest number is 48. And there that is. And if I connect this to this, um, then we are going to be producing random note numbers, or at least for, for, Max, for Max's purposes, they're, they're just numbers. Um, but we are considering them notes or note numbers. Um, and I'm just going to pop in a, um, a, a number box just so that we can test this. And by the way, there's no reason why you shouldn't do that. In fact, I would encourage you to do so to test the, uh, the the results of whatever it is that you're doing regularly using various objects that will allow you to display them. Um, so in this case, I'm using a number box because this is outputting numbers. Lock the patch. And what numbers are we getting? Well, you should see we're getting from the note 48 to the note 60 eventually. Haven't seen 60 yet. Uh, definitely there. There it is. I saw it once. Took a while to get there. So, um, so we only have two objects remaining that we haven't connected up, um, and those are the produce. The, those are the means of actually producing the sound. So it says, um, uh, so that the cycle object generates random pitches. Well, we obviously need to send uh, cycle those pitches in some form, um, but here we're outputting note numbers. And yet cycle, if you hover over its uh, left-hand inlet, we see that it only accepts a frequency as its input. Um, so we have to find some way of translating from note number to frequency. And we will use M2F for that. So this is a MIDI to frequency object. If I go to the help menu, you'll see convert a MIDI note number to a frequency. That's exactly what we want. And so if I connect the MIDI note number that's coming out of there to cycle, so M2F spits out a frequency which we can connect to cycle. Then the cycle object will produce a sound of the frequency that we've requested. And then that, of course, can go to the output. 
and that's it. So I'll shrink this a little bit. That is our uh, entire patch, which I can get rid of that. And we now should have exactly what we asked for. So again, the message. When you get a brief like this, don't panic. Do the bits you know that you understand first of all, and then fill in the blanks after that. Um, at any point, you can look at the help file for the various objects and see what they do. Um, and uh, and always hover over inlets to figure out what uh, what data is acceptable to um, to each object, and also what, of course, they spit out. Um, so that's question six, and another 10% if you get that right. Move on to this one. So this one says, use the selector object to select between four different oscillators, cycle, rect, saw, and triangle. Connect up the number object to allow a way to change which oscillator is selected. Um, and the output of the selector should be connected to the easy DAC object, which is this one down here. And the selector object uh, object will require an argument. So we haven't actually put any arguments in these, but in fact the only one that requires one is the selector object. I have actually made a bit of a mistake here, I realise, because it says the output of selector should be connected to the EasyDAC object. Well, it should be connected to it, but via this volume control. So I hope uh, that didn't produce too much confusion, and I apologise if it did. But if you've done any of the exercises up to this point, then uh, hopefully it'll be fairly obvious that that needs to be there. So, uh, what are we being asked for? To select between four different oscillators. So what does the selector do? Uh, well, the way to find out what selector does is to go to its help file, and here you will see, basically this, this shows you a good proportion of the patch that you need to know. It shows you that three different oscillators here, including pink noise, are being connected um, by means of three inlets. Um, notice that there's nothing um, with signal connected to the left-hand one because that has a number box connected to it. Um, and if you look at this bit up here, it's telling you that that number box uh, via this, these radio buttons is what is choosing which of the, uh, which of the inlets are open. Um, so uh, we choose uh, zero is all inlets off, one would be opening the first inlet, two would be opening the second inlet, and three would be opening the third one. Um, and we have three inlets there because selector has been given an argument like we, we, we wanted. Um, this one, in this case, it's being given the number three, but of course we have four inlets here. We've got cycle, rect, uh, try, and saw. So our selector object will require an argument of four. Then we get our relevant uh, inlets. So we can connect those up in whatever order you want. In fact, this is probably not the most intuitive order, but anyway, that will do. And then, just as with the example that we looked at, we would want uh, the number box to go to the left-hand inlet of that in order to control which of those inlets were open. Um, so, uh, at that point, um, we've got one object left, and we've got this still to be connected. So, uh, the key K slider is going to be at the top because that's our main means of controlling the uh, pitches. And just as what I said before about um, the cycle object requiring a frequency input in order to generate a uh, sound of an appropriate pitch, um, the rest of these do too. So these all have frequency required from their left-hand inlets. And of course, uh, our MIDI to frequency object converts our MIDI notes, which we'll be getting from the K slider to frequencies, so we can connect that to all four whoops, of those. Um, and then finally, we need to uh, connect the selector to um, the gain control, and that's it. Um, so here again, we can test it, except that I want to get rid of this one. Turn this one up. And so that's our rectangle or square wave. It's actually a pulse train at the moment because there's no argument in there to sort out the um, 
uh, duty cycle, triangle wave, and a sawtooth wave. Um, so that's got what we want it to. Um, and zero obviously is not, nothing open, so we get nothing. So another question completed successfully. Move on. There's a clicking coming from my computer, I don't know why. Oh, that's because selector is still open. There we go. Okay. Oh, and this one's the last one. Wow, we're nearly there. Good, okay. So now we're being asked to make a simple three note step sequencer. Um, and this one pretty much tells you what to do in order. So it says, use the toggle object to turn the metro object on and off. So we take the toggle, whoops, toggle, we take the metro, connect them up. Um, use the number object to determine the time interval for metro. So we do that. The metro should be used to drive the counter, and counter should be used to step through the select object. So we will connect metro to the counter, like that, um, and we will count three numbers in counter. So we will count from zero to two. That will be uh, three notes, or three, uh, three counts. Uh, and use that to in conjunction with the select object. So we connect the counter to the select object and we allow select to select any one of those numbers. Oops. Uh, the button objects are not strictly necessary. Uh, where, where are we? Sorry. Yeah. The select object should be given three arguments and should be used to trigger output from three number boxes, which will send note numbers to the make note object and note out. So uh, I'm going to use the buttons here. Which aren't, as I say, strictly necessary, but they're there anyway. And then we can connect that up to each of these number boxes and the number boxes to make notes. So make note is what's converting these numbers into um, notes of a particular duration, so it's giving them a velocity and it's giving them a note length, and then those in turn are going to note out, which is being, which is communicating with our internal MIDI synth. Um, so that's that's basically this first bit that uh, we've completed, and then it says you should use the preset object to store at least three preferred note sequences. Uh, note that the you need to connect the left hand outlet of preset objects to the objects you want to include in the preset. Okay, so. Preset object is um, useful for storing the state of particular objects um, for recall later. Um, and as it says up there, you need to collect the left hand outlet of the preset object to any objects you want to store the uh, state of. So we will connect them to these three number boxes because those are the notes we want to store. Um, and then we can choose some notes that would be part of our sequence. So I'll make, uh, actually I'll just write them in because I will take ages dragging through to them. Oops. Okay, so we have a, a little triad there. Whoops, let's slow the metro down a little bit. Okay, so that's uh, all fine. Um, now to store these, what you need to do, having connected uh, the preset to them, you press the shift key and then click on one of the nodules. When you do so, you'll see that it changes colour a little bit um, and that says that the, the preset has been stored. So the state of those objects has now been stored. I can now change the values in those number boxes to um, uh, so I've just changed those to another kind of um, inversion of the chord. Um, and once again, I can press shift and click on a nodule of the preset object and it will store that state um, and so on. So uh, 72, um, 67 and 76 maybe. So that one. Um, and that means that when you have the whole thing running and click a preset,
So it's worked. It's it's stored the presets and it's been able to restore them as well. Um, now there's lots of other things we could do to uh, to improve this patch to make it uh, work better for us. Um, and that's really what the rest of this question is. So if you manage to do this part of the question, you'll get 10%, um, which is great. Uh, and then uh, it also says there's a 20% bonus for improving the design of the sequence of further. So this is where you can get creative and do some additional bits and pieces to make the patch work better for us or for you. Um, and one of those things might be, you notice that the uh, number boxes produce a chord every time you update them. Uh, which you might not want, you might only want to hear the, the counter cycling through them. Um, so what we can do to improve that would be to isolate these number boxes and instead run those numbers through message boxes. So let's make three of those. Now the reason for that is because um, when we send the num when these, these number box update, then immediately the number 60, 64, and 67 in this case are spat out the bottom. Oops. Um, well, if I connect them to the right hand inlets of the message boxes, then they update the message boxes, but they don't produce output because they're being sent, as you notice, to a cold inlet. Um, and then I can send a bang to the left hand inlet when I want them to actually produce output. So if I connect these up, so basically these have replaced the number boxes that were in were producing the notes before, and the number boxes have just been moved up here and are feeding those message boxes. So now, if I look at the patch, nothing happens because I haven't sent anything yet. But now you don't get that chord every time you click on the preset object, and yet it still updates the relevant notes. So that works fine. That's exactly what we want, um, uh, or at least what I decided I wanted. Um, another thing that you could do, for example, is to change the output of this. So instead of going through a make note, we could actually uh, borrow some of the stuff that we've used over here. So this is a very quick way of earning a point or two, is to think, oh, well, actually, I've got some code over here that I can copy across. So once again, we are copying, we're borrowing previous code or code from somewhere else. Now, here are our note numbers, and we want to use those to um, drive these oscillators. We no longer need the note out of the communication to the um, external MIDI synth, so we can get rid of that, and instead I will connect this up to those note numbers instead, or at least the message boxes that are containing those note numbers. And now, Obviously we don't hear anything, but we will when, oops, I turn this on and turn up the volume. So that works fine. Another thing you could perhaps do is to have Metro produce a random number from all of these available numbers um, that are controlling um, selector in order to choose a different timbre with every note. So we could say, okay, we want a random number of five, that will give us random numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, connect that to Metro and that will. Um, because sometimes it produces a, a zero, um, then we get a rest from time to time. And this preset object still continues to function in the way that we wanted it to. And of course, if we only wanted to hear sounds, we didn't want any of those rests, we could make a random value of 4 and add 1, so that our numbers coming out are always above 0. So, as I say, the last um, uh, exercise there, or last uh, question there, allows you to be a bit creative with what you want to do, so that you can kind of uh, consider some of the ideas that we've looked at elsewhere in these uh, uh, first few weeks of Max, um, and, uh, and apply them in order to get extra bonus points. So I hope that's helped, um, and uh, I think that's it.